you know, one of the key insights of behavioral economics is that our minds engage in sort of two types of thinking of which we're only aware of one. And yes. so the sort of the deliberate kind of weighing of pros and cons, sort of that's psychologists or and behavioral economists call that slow thinking. So Danny Kahneman and his Danny wonderful Kahn's book, work, right, right. Uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, calls that system two. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that that's very sort of mentally effortful. And, you know, when we're when our mental bandwidth is depleted, when we're under stress, we're not thinking deliberately. We are like uh, our, our minds are designed to have another type of thinking that is so low effort, it happens below the level of consciousness. It's almost automatic or involuntary. It's fast thinking or Danny Kahneman calls it uh, system one thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's designed to respond in ways that are usually helpful to us, but can cause trouble when they're overgeneralized, right? And so we um, came up with this hypothesis that a lot of this gun violence might really be system one, not system two driven. But then it was really important for us to test it. So the very first right. project that the crime lab did is we partnered with this amazing nonprofit in Chicago called Youth Guidance. They'd come up mm -hmm. with this amazing social program called Becoming a Man that basically right. helps people not go on tilt. Is, is one way to, to say it. And, um, you know, we it's raised- a great analogy, by the way. I really yeah, like Thank it. you. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, we worked with um, uh, Richard M. Daly was the mayor at the time. We're yep. just so grateful to him and the MacArthur and Joyce Foundations for helping us raise, uh, I think we raised something like a million dollars um, to serve as many kids with BAM as we could. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't enough to serve every kid who would benefit in Chicago, uh, which is a huge number. Um, and so we basically like held a, a random lottery to decide which eligible kids would would get the program. And so yep. then you can sort of see if you're flipping a coin to decide which eligible kids get it. It's like then you've got two groups of kids who are similar on average because you've allocated the program with a coin flip and that you're in a world that's very similar to like a randomized control trial. You can compare the subsequent outcomes of the two groups, they're the same on average because they're randomly assigned to one or the other. And when we look at, you know, when we use like police department data to look at rates of violence involvement down the road, we can see that the kids who get the program are like 50% less likely to get arrested for violent crime. Mm. They're also much less likely to get arrested for gun carrying. And so you can see like all of that is pointing in the direction to big reductions in, in gun violence for these kids. Explain I mean, how the... Explain how this works, Jens. What, what goes into the training and becoming a man? Yeah, I think, you know, if you sort of think about how poker players learn to go on tilt or to, okay. to, to not go on tilt. Stay off tilt, yes. Stay off tilt, thank you. If you think about how poker players learn to stay off tilt, um, you know, the way that the way that humans, the, the way that human learning happens uh, often is through trial and error. Mm-hmm. And the way poker players learn this is like, you know, you're you're sitting at a table and you get super pissed and all of a sudden you've lost five hands in a row. And it's yes. like, oh, I've just I've just learned a very expensive lesson. But if you're talking about poker, there's only so costly the lesson can be. Yes. Right. If you're a 16 year old kid living in Englewood and you get this wrong, the the costs can be really, really severe, like life alteringly severe, right? And so one way to think about at a high level what these programs are doing is they're trying to give kids sort of lower stakes opportunities to learn to go off tilt um, through practice and trial and error. And so as a way to sort of see that, let me explain the sort of the very first Please. Um, exercise that the kids do in becoming a man. So this is like middle school and high school age uh, boys um, in you know, some of the most economically disadvantaged high violence neighborhoods on the south and west sides of Chicago. And they get out of an academic class once a week to participate. There's like 12 kids in the group. There's a, you know, a program counselor. And so then they pair us up. So Paul, you and I would be a pair. They would, you know, uh, the first exercise is called the fist. They would give me a rubber ball and say, uh, Paul, you have 30 seconds to get the ball out of Jens's hand. Uh, the only rule is there are no rules, go. And so what most of the kids do is they basically just beat the crap out of each other for 30 seconds. You will try and pry my hand open. You'll break yep. my pinky. That won't work. You'll put me in a headlock. That won't work. You'll start punching me in the stomach. Then the program counselor will call time. 
and then we'll switch. You've got the ball. I do the same thing to you. And then they'll reconvene us and they'll say, um, we'll do a debrief and they'll say, okay, Paul, what, what strategies did you employ? And, um, you know, what you'll say is, uh, you know, something like I tried to pry open his hand. I broke his pinky. I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, then, you know, the, the program counselor will say, why didn't you ask for the ball? And, you know, the kid will say, because it's very striking. And I think become, I think Youth Guidance has now done BAM with, you know, thousands, maybe 10,000 kids now or mm. something over the last decade. And what the Youth Guidance folks say is like literally not more than a handful or two of kids ever think to ask. Hmm. And the kid version of, of Paul Rand will say some version of like, oh, if I would have asked Jens for the ball, he would have thought I was, uh, and you can imagine yep. what the kids yep. say. Um, so that's sort of like, you know, trial, error, and reflection is sort of the key to learning. And so we've just had our little trial and error kind of experience now here's the reflection step and you're realizing, oh, I, there was a solution strategy going back to sodas. There was a solution strategy that I didn't even think about, right? Because I made an assumption about the situation here that Jens would have thought I was a whatever. Yep. And then the, progr the program counselor will turn to me and say, Jens, what would you have done if Paul had asked for the ball? And then I say, I would have given it to him. It's just a stupid rubber ball. It's much better than having my pinky broken and being <laughs> punched in the stomach and whatever. And there you can sort of see it's like trial, error, uh, and feedback about how your system, one, made an assumption about the situation, about the potential sort of solutions that you might consider in a way that led you astray. All right. You mentioned a second ago police. And it's impossible to have this conversation without the answer is just we need more police. Where do police fit into this equation? Police violence fits into this equation. How should we think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this sort of behavioral economics perspective on violence, I think, has a number of like really important implications for how we think about policing in America. So, I think there are lots and lots of analogies between sort of crime and police misconduct. Um, you know, in as I note in, in the book, like if you think about crime by civilians, there there are bad apples in the civilian world, right? There yeah. are so, something like one percent of American men are psychopaths. Hmm. Right. They they are they may be incorrigible, but they are like clearly very different from the rest of us and they do terrible things. Um, they don't dominate all the crime and violence that happens, but they are clearly a part of it. Mm -hmm. In the same way in policing, there are clearly some people who should not be cops. And I think, you know, I know a bunch of people on the Chicago Police Department, like they would be the first to tell you, like that that guy should not be a cop. Right? Yeah. So, right. so there really is, there's a, with that said, it is also the case that a bunch of the misconduct that happens in the same way that like a bunch of crime that happens is like normal people making a mistake in a diff difficult situation. The data seem to suggest that a fair amount of misconduct has the same sort of flavor. It's like, you know, not someone who's a, uh, a bad Apple cop. They're just making a mistake in a very difficult situation. And, and, and one of the ways that we know that is, you know, my, my colleagues, Andrula Dubé, who's here at the University of Chicago, Sandy Joe MacArthur used to be at LAPD and um, uh, Anud Shah, who is now at Princeton, hmm. they did this amazing project where they basically did a version of BAM for Chicago cops, right? And they, they developed this sort of AI-driven virtual simulator thing where they use that to give cops experience like going through situations to see de-escalation type things yeah it's but it's but it's more than it's more than de-escalation right because part of it i think at least as important as like de-escalation skills is helping them not latch on to their very first assumption about the situation mm, got it right so it's like it's like how do you prevent the cop from going on tilt yep, yep. right and it's like if you if you think that someone, if you're a cop and you think that someone's being disrespectful or you think that someone's being aggressive or you think that someone's ignoring your order, you're going to be much more likely to go on tilt than recognizing, oh, I'm in Pilsen 
maybe that person's ignoring my orders because they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. Maybe before I, you know, you can sort of imagine, right? Just as, a, as like sure. one sort of simple example. And so they, they developed all of these sort of simulation exercises that help cops see, oh, I, I very quickly, my system one too quickly jumped to a conclusion about what the situation was. That was wrong. And I'm learning to be a little bit more skeptical of my initial system one assessment of what's going on. That is, I'm, I'm learning to be a little bit more system two in those situations. And you can see in the data, like these were real Chicago cops going through training in the academy and then going out all over Chicago patrolling. And then we're looking at the data to see what happens. And what mm -hmm. you can see is that there are reductions in police use of force. And there are narrowing of disparities in arrests between white, white and black mm. citizens. And there's a reduction in what we believe to be sort of low level, low public safety value arrests. You, you've made in this discussion, in the book, it works. This should be an easy solve. We, we know what the answer is. Why are we having this conversation? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, I, I think the reason that we're having this conversation is because I think it sort of flows a little bit from where we where we started. Like we okay. keep forgetting the lesson of what gun violence is mm. because we're getting very non-representative pictures of gun violence from the media. Yeah. You know, okay. We're seeing the robbery. We're seeing the robberies at, that turn into shootings. We're seeing the gang wars over drug selling turf. When we watch The Wire, when we turn on the evening news, that dominates our thinking. No wonder everybody believes that gun violence is due to either bad people unafraid of the criminal justice system or economically desperate people, mm -hmm. right? No wonder that that conventional wisdom persists. And, and so if that's your understanding of the problem, then you look at a lot of these sort of behavioral economics informed solutions and they feel like, oh, these feel like distractions yes, from addressing the real issues. Yep. And I, I hope what the book does, so it's Unforgiving Places, The Unexpected Origins of American Gun Violence, coming out April 21st from the University of Chicago Press. What the book tries to do- You're getting pretty is, good at that plug stuff. Thank you. Right? That thank was you. very nice. Uh, what I'm trying to do in the book is remind people of this lesson that we keep forgetting, which is that is not what gun violence is. Here's what it really is. It's arguments yep. that lead to violence. And- once you've got that diagnosis right, it leads to just a very... So I think that's sort of the key thing is reminding people that the problem isn't what they did. 